on World News Tonight. New reigns. Chris Hinkins was officially sworn in as Prime Minister of New Zealand. Nuclear tensions. Mike Pompeo releases a morbid revelation on the Jammu Kashmir crisis. What exactly did he reveal? Find out tonight. New developments. More classified documents unveiled at another top official's home. And a tulip turn up. Flamboyant blooms welcome National Tulip Day, making a colorful splash in Amsterdam. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for being with us on World News. Now we are starting our broadcast tonight with a new memoir by former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo stating that India and Pakistan came close to a nuclear conflagration in February 2019. This happened after a daily launch strike against militants in Pakistani territory following an attack on Indian troops in Kashmir. Pakistan had said it had shot down two Indian military jets and captured a fighter pilot. India and Pakistan claim all of Kashmir but control only parts of it. India has long accused Pakistan of backing separatist militants in the Kashmir Valley, a charge Islamabad denies. The nuclear-armed neighbours have fought three wars since independence from Britain and partition in 1947. All but one were over Kashmir. In Never Give an Inch, fighting for the America I love, Mike Pompeo says he does not think the world properly knows just how close the India-Pakistan rivalry came to spilling over into a nuclear conflagration in February 2019. After the attack on Indian troops that killed more than 40 soldiers, an Islamic terrorist attack probably enabled in part of Pakistan's lax counter-terror policies, according to Pompeo, India had responded with airstrikes inside Pakistan. The Pakistanis shot down a plane in a subsequent dogfight and kept the Indian pilot prisoner. Neither India nor Pakistan have commented so far on Pompeo's claims. The 2019 attack on Indian soldiers was claimed by a group based in Pakistan, Jaish e Mohammed, and India had vowed to retaliate. India's aerial attacks across the line of control, dividing India and Pakistani territory, were the first since the war in 1971. India said it had killed a large number of militants, but Pakistan called the claim reckless. India's right-wing government has used emergency powers to block the airing of a BBC documentary which questions Prime Minister Narendra Modi's leadership during the 2002 Gujarat riots. Calling the two-part BBC film India, the Modi question, a propaganda piece, the government ordered Twitter to take down more than 50 tweets linking to the documentary while YouTube was instructed to block any video uploads. A screening of the documentary at one of India's premier universities on Tuesday was disrupted by the authorities who allegedly cut the power and internet lines to the office of the Students' Union which had organized the event. Uh, India Media uh, reported that stones were thrown at students uh, watching the film. Similar screenings were also reported from other parts of the country while opposition leaders, journalists and activists continued to share links to the BBC documentary on social media to defy the government order. New reigns have taken over the leadership of New Zealand as Labour leader Chris Himkins was sworn in as New Zealand's Prime Minister in a formal ceremony earlier today, following the resignation of outgoing Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern last week. The Labour Party elected former COVID-19 response and police minister Hipkins to lead the party and the country on Sunday. Former Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern resigned last week saying she had no more in the tank to lead the country. Hundreds gathered in the grounds of parliament as Ardern left for the final time, hugging each of her members in parliament in return, with many looking visibly emotional. She then travelled to Government House where she tendered her resignation to King Charles' representative in New Zealand, Governor-General Cindy Hero. Hipkins and his Deputy General Carmel Sepuloni, the first person of Pacific Islander descent to hold the role, were then sworn in in a ceremony lasting a few minutes. Hours later, Hipkins met with journalists after his first cabinet meeting as Prime Minister, bombarded with questions about the cost of living hours after fresh price data came in above analyst forecasts. Hipkins said he would make the issue central to his policy agenda. However, he pushed back against announcing new policies immediately, saying he would make haste but not create policy on the fly. Hipkins, however, said that he would honour commitments already made for the current term of parliament. Known as Chippy, Hipkins is well known to New Zealanders for his competence in tackling COVID-19, though he acknowledged some mistakes in handling the pandemic and faces a tough battle to retain power in an October general election. A poll released in December had Labour support falling to 33% from 40% at the start of 2022, meaning the party would not be able to form a majority even with the traditional coalition partner, the Green Party, at 9%. The opposition National Party has benefited from Labour's decline. 
There has been another major development on the handling of classified documents in the United States, along with bipartisan criticism that a sitting president, a former president, and now a former vice president have all acknowledged having classified material in unsecure locations. Classified files have been found at ex-U.S. Vice President Mike Pence's home in the latest discovery of secret papers. Former Vice President Mike Pence turned over classified documents found at his Indiana home last week. Attorney Greg Jacob notified the National Archives of the documents on January 18th and confirmed the FBI came to collect them the next evening. The discovery puts Pence in the company of former President Donald Trump and President Joe Biden after documents marked as classified were found at their residences. Both Trump and Biden are now facing special counsel investigations by the Justice Department over improper handling of classified materials. Jacob wrote in a letter to the National Archives that out of an abundance of caution, Pence had engaged outside counsel to review records stored in his home after the recent reports about Biden. The lawyers identified a small number of documents that, quote, could potentially contain sensitive or classified information, according to Jacob, who added, Vice President Pence immediately secured those documents in a locked safe pending further direction on proper handling from the National Archives. On January 20th, Pence's attorney contacted the National Archives to reiterate an earlier offer to submit four boxes of administrative papers from Pence's home. The four boxes were reviewed by Pence's attorney, sealed, and were set to be delivered on January 23rd. Microsoft Core was hit with a networking outage that took down its cloud platform Azure along with services such as Teams and Outlook, potentially affecting millions of users globally. Azure's status page showed services were impacted in America, Europe, Asia, Pacific, Middle East and Africa. Only services in China and its platform for governments were not hit. An outage of Microsoft's cloud computing platform Azure can impact a variety of services and create a domino effect as almost all of the world's largest companies use that platform. Microsoft did not disclose the number of users affected by the disruption, but data from the outage tracking website Down Detector showed thousands of incidents disrupted across the continent. Outages of big tech platforms are not uncommon as several companies ranging from Google to Meta have seen service disruptions. Azure, the second largest cloud service provider after Amazon, faced outages last year. Over in the war in Ukraine, Ukraine dismissed more than a dozen senior officials, including governors of several major battlefield provinces, in the biggest shakeup of its wartime leadership since Russia's invasion last year. Several high-ranking members of the Ukrainian government have resigned or been fired in the biggest shakeup of the war, with corruption allegations hovering over some of them in what President Volodymyr Zelensky's administration is billing as a sign the leader is in tune with his citizens. Zelensky here warning of the departures. More are expected in coming days. Those leaving include the country's deputy defense minister, Vyacheslav Shapovalov, after a Ukrainian news outlet accused the defense ministry of inflating the price of food supplies for troops. They include Alexei Simonenko, a deputy prosecutor general, after reportedly spending a 10-day New Year's family vacation on the Spanish coast despite the conflict and a deputy head of the president's office itself, Kirilo Timoshenko, who'd been criticized for driving sports cars during the invasion. He gave no reason for his exit and has previously denied wrongdoing, saying the cars were rented. Meanwhile, the defense ministry denies the allegations of price inflation, but says their man's removal will help retain trust in the agency. And the prosecutor's office? says Simonenko left according to his own wishes. President Zelensky says that, going forward, no government officials will be allowed to leave the country during wartime except on official business. Five governors of battlefield provinces were also dismissed. President Zelensky, a former actor and comedian, swept to power as a political outsider, promising to rid Ukraine of long, ongoing problems with corruption. 
But the war has largely frozen domestic politics, and political rivalries have been pushed to the side to focus on the country's survival. We're going into a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, after U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen called China a barrier to debt reform in Africa this week, Chinese officials in Zambia had a pointed response to get your own house in order. The Chinese embassy in Zambia said on its website the biggest contribution that the U.S. can make to the debt issues outside the country is to act on the responsible monetary policies, cope with its own debt problem and stop sabotaging other sovereign countries' active efforts to solve their debt issues. Republicans in the House of Representatives are using a risky, unusual threat to refuse to vote in a new debt ceiling, a figure that reflects money already spent and now owned by the government, to pressure the Biden administration and Democrats to cut spending programs. So far, the Biden White House is refusing to negotiate, counting on hardline Republicans to step back under pressure from businesses, investors and moderates. U.S. national debt is about 31 trillion U.S. dollars, a figure that has skyrocketed since 2000's 5.6 trillion U.S. dollars, thanks in part to increased spending for an aging population, outlays for Iraq and Afghanistan wars, COVID-19 programs and tax cuts that trimmed revenues. Yellen and International Monetary Fund Managing Director Kristaline Georgieva arrived separately in Zambia to highlight the need for debt reform in Africa. Zambia defaulted on its debt in 2020 and has made little progress to restructure it with Chinese and private creditors to date, a situation that has helped push citizens into poverty. The World Bank has stated that the world's poorest countries faced US$35 billion US dollars in debt service payments to official and private sector creditors in 2022, more than 40% of which was due to China. Argentina and Brazil, the two largest economies in South America, are in early talks to create a common currency as part of a coordinated bid to reduce reliance on the US dollar. But some analysts are highly skeptical, dismissing the proposal as pie in the sky because the discrepancies between the two economies and the rapid shift of political winds in the region. Brazilian President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva returned to the international scene on Monday with a trip to Argentina, Brazil's big neighbour and trading partner, where he was welcomed with open arms by his counterpart Alberto Fernandes. There, Lula promised to recover the bilateral relationship that, quote, should never have stopped and extended his apologies to the Argentinian people for what he described as the rudeness of his predecessor in office, Jair Bolsonaro. I feel, said the president, and I believe that it is my role in this mandate in front of Brazil. If I can, I will be a builder of peace. Lula wants to create a common currency in Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay, which would allow the South American bloc to remove its dependency on the US dollar. After travelling first to Uruguay, the president will meet German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in Brasilia on January 30th. He is also expected to fly to Washington on February 10th to meet his US counterpart Joe Biden. The National Transportation Safety Board, or the NTSB, faulted Ethiopia's final report into the March 2019 Boeing 737 MAX fatal crash and said investigators did not adequately address the performance of the flight crew. NTSB Chair Jennifer Hormandy said that in an interview that Ethiopia's Aircraft Investigation Bureau had made errors in its report. The MAX crashes in 2018 and 2019 in Indonesia and Ethiopia, which cost Boeing more than $20 billion, led to a 20-month grounding for the best-selling plane that was lifted by regulators after Boeing made software and pilot training changes. Boeing declined to comment on Tuesday. The NTSB was not given a chance to review or comment on Ethiopia's final report before it was made public last month, a violation of rules overseen by the United Nations' Montreal-based aviation agency. The NTSB said that earlier Ethiopian inspectors investigating the cause of the March 2019 Ethiopian Airlines crash that killed 157 people did not pay enough attention to crew training and emergency procedures in their report. In a freak turn of events, Europe's busiest airport shut down in Istanbul while schools and vaccination centers closed in Athens as a rare snowstorm blanketed swaths of the eastern Mediterranean, causing blackouts and traffic havoc. 
The heaviest snowfall recorded in Mallorca in the last five years fell on Monday. That's according to experts who say the coldest temperatures were recorded in the early hours of the morning in the Tramontana Mountains at minus 2.4 degrees Celsius. The Palmer Met Office says as much as 10 centimeters of snow will fall on Wednesday and it's forecast to fall on lower ground as well. Over in Italy, several regions have been put on an extreme weather alert, with a wave of freezing conditions, heavy snow and powerful winds hitting the country. The Marche region and parts of Emilia-Romagna in the north of the country are on orange alert, meaning that the weather poses a danger to people and property. A snowstorm hampered traffic on a key highway in Slovenia and left parts of the country temporarily without electricity. In Croatia, snow and strong winds also caused traffic problems on the Adriatic coast and in the mountains. The bad weather left many islands cut off from the mainland. And in Austria's Carinthia, heavy snow caused power outages, closed roads and shut schools. Around 5,000 households were left without electricity and 250 fire brigades were called out in the area. While the risk of avalanches heightened, the increased snow means the winter season for skiers should be secured until Easter. The nominations for the 95th Academy Awards have been announced with Sky-Fi family drama Everything Everywhere All at Once leading the pack with 11 nods. Oh, the 10 nominees. The countdown for the 95th Academy Awards has begun with nominations finally revealed. And there were five words the hosts couldn't stop saying. Everything, everywhere, all at once. The sci-fi comedy drama raking in a total of 11 nominations. Across the multiverse, I've seen thousands of Evelyn's. Starring Michelle Yao, this twisty adventure follows a Chinese-American immigrant as she battles to save her laundromat. Remain. The first is achieving. Two European co productions have snatched up nine nominations the German war film All is Quiet on the Western Front and the Irish dark comedy The Banshees of Inishirin, set on a fictitious island off the coast of Ireland against the backdrop of the Civil War. He used to be the best of friends. Martin McDonough's tale of feuding friends has been a European box office hit. Finally, in the Best International Features category, four European films out of five nominees received a nod. Another Irish picture, The Quiet Girl, the Polish film EO, All is Quiet on the Western Front, and finally, the Belgian drama Close, which claimed the grand prize of the Cannes Film Festival last summer. The Academy Awards will be hosted in Los Angeles on the 13th of March. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Satellite imagery shows that an iceberg almost the size of Greater London has broken off the 150 meter thick front ice shelf in Atlantica. A rescue operation was underway today after a cargo ship sank off southwestern Japan during fierce winter's winds. Planes and ships, including private vessels, were assisting in the search of an area lying some 110 kilometers west of the Jangjo Island. Atomic scientists set the doomsday clock to 90 seconds to midnight, closer than ever before, saying that threats of nuclear war, disease and climate volatility have been exacerbated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, putting humanity to great risk of inflation. Following back-to-back -back mass shootings that killed 18 people in California, Democrats are renewing a push for assault weapons to be banned, with State Governor Gavin Newsom taking furious swipe at officials who had blocked ongoing attempts at winning in gun violence. Honda said it would create a new division in a bid to strengthen and speed up its electrification drive as part of an overhaul of the structure. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. So we're leaving you tonight with flamboyant blooms of tulips in Amsterdam, welcoming Tulip Day. Stay safe and have a good night.